Hello and welcome to the Coon Hunting University Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Duncan. And like always, class is in session. Hey y'all. So today's episode is brought to you by Superior Light Company. Man, they make an awesome light. Mr. Jamie and Mr. Sam do a great job. Go over there, check them out. You can use discount code CHU Podcast at checkout and receive a 5% discount, which equates to almost $20 on a Hellcat Max. That's a really good deal, especially considering that it's an exclusive deal for Coonut University podcast listeners. Remember, that's CHU Podcast at checkout, and it's only available at night, N-I-T-E, hunters.com. Check it out. So today we're going to be finishing up with Mr. Joseph Gary Krantz's second part of his interview. We're going to be talking more about where the red fern grows and the comparison of his book to it, right? Which is pretty awesome. We're also going to be talking about how his 30 years in the Air Force affected his books. Maybe some things that us as coon hunters need to bring with us to the woods because Mr. Joseph was a survival expert in the United States Air Force. He taught survival school. So it's really interesting to get his perspective on that. And remember, if you like what you hear here from Mr. Joseph, please go to Ryland Creek. Two, two being spelled out, TWO.com, and check him out. Subscribe to his newsletter. We're also giving away three copies of The Last Coon Hunter on the Coon Hunting University Facebook page right now. The drawing will be held October 15th. So go to the Coon Hunting University Facebook page, like the Facebook page, share the post, it's pinned to the top, and tag three friends in the comments. So you can only enter once a day but you can enter three times over the course of the whole giveaway. So there's three books that are possible for you to win, and you have three times to try to win those three books. Now, one person can only win one book, of course. I think it's a great deal, and I kind of set it up that way. Mr. Joseph was generous enough to give these books to everybody. But even if you don't win, you can still go purchase the book. Start reading the saga. The saga is a great saga to start. I mean, it really is. And even if you're skeptical about it, just try the first book, right? The Last Coon Hunter. That's the first one you'll start with. Just try it out. If you don't like it, you don't have to read it no more. But I think you'll be hooked, especially if you love to read fiction and stories like that. Without further ado, here's part two of Mr. Joseph's interview. Y'all sit back and enjoy. Are the places in your book that you write about Nathan hunting, for those who don't know, Nathan is the main character in, what, the first three books? Yeah, Nathan is, uh, well, yeah, he's in Last Cooner. He's in An Exceptional Hound. So uh, I'd say the first two books, he's he's a he's one of the primary characters. It's a family saga, so it's hard to say who's the main character. Yeah, I get that all the time. As well, yeah. is, it, is it Jacob? <laughs> is it is it yeah. Nathan? But the places that Nathan hunts, uh, yeah, those are pretty much real areas. That, that I don't use the uh, the real names, although people sometimes figure them out around here. Um, I'll have people uh, parked on my land, and what they're doing is they're taking pictures of the places. And I, I don't get mad at them. I just, I know what they're doing. I just drive on by, <laughs> you know, because they said, Oh, that's the bridge. That's the bridge. We know that bridge from the story. And so, uh, but I did make up the names. And part of that reason why I did that was because my wife said to me, because I did have the real names in there originally. And my wife said, do you like how secluded your, those, those roads are? I said, yeah, where are you going with this? And she goes, you know, if your books ever become popular, especially in a local area, uh, people are going to start driving up and down these roads just to say that they do that. And I have a, there's a college professor who's uh, one of my uh, reader fans, and he's, he, he'll he tell me, uh, he'll send me a text message every now and then saying, yep, I drove up that road and I was thinking about your books. I said, okay, well, that's great. But uh, uh, the idea, though, is that, yeah, we, it, yeah, does the land exist that way? Yeah. Yeah, those are, um, those are pretty much real places uh, here and inspirations for it. Now you, of course, because it's fiction and a story, you're going to embellish a little bit, of course. But, but as far as in general speaking, yeah, these, these areas really exist. There really is a Sugar Hill uh, area. That one I did call out. Uh, that's a little further from here. But that is, there really is an Irwin game management area. Yeah. So there are some real names on there, but a lot of the roads, though, I have a tendency to, to change those just a little bit. 
Yeah, and I was wondering that when I was reading, just uh, and I didn't know anything about you as a person then or anything, but now that I've talked to you and everything, I, I can kind of see how you would, you know, I know you said it's fiction, you embellish it, but just from what I've picked up on you, that, that is, you know, where you really hunt and how it really looks, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So tell me about the book's audience. What type of folks read your books? Okay, well, that's a excellent question because, uh, as I told you earlier, uh, that one quote we were both talking about, about the, the individual said it's really about the people who go coon hunting, not coon hunting. Well, that was again, that's an anti hunter. She's told me personally, is that uh, you're the most respectful hunter I know. I'd, I'd say, well, I don't know how many hunters you know, but <laughs> but uh, but the idea though is that yeah, you, it is a pretty broad audience. So I've I've got people who come right out and say they're non hunters. Uh, had people come out and say I'd never go coon hunting, but I'm definitely going to read all your books, and they have. Uh, you know, I do have a very broad audience. It's not just two hunters alone, although hunters. I think take it to a, a deeper level on, of understanding uh, some of the things that are happening or they can picture it uh, much easier. But I, as you kind of noted, I do go into description, maybe perhaps more than another author in another genre might. But the idea is, though, is to put the reader out there in the woods to make them experience the same thing that the hunter is, uh, the noises, the, the cold wind up here, particularly in the winter, uh, you want that to come through so that they are experiencing it for the first time. I had people who uh, who have told me, now, whether well, they actually show up or not, we'll see, but they said, we want to go with you one night. And I said, okay, that's fine. I've got a, there's a young man here. I think, he's, I think he just turned a teenager. Uh, he's a fan of the books, and his parents just moved in closer to where I am now. And I, I imagine this uh, season i'll be taking him out a couple times but yeah the, the, it is a pretty broad audience and i've read where people compared your books to where the red fern grows do you embrace that comparison oh yeah absolutely um and, and wilson rawls who wrote where the red fern grows i mean he set the standard really for bond between hounds and and hunter I mean, between billy and old dan little and right so um you're never going to be able to surpass that he did it and I've had other folks say that it's a cross between where the Fred Fern grows and Legends of the Fall. And that's more back to the people. You're talking about the people who do it. Uh, and, you know, and where the Red Fern grows. Billy was kind of on his own, if you remember. Uh, his father was kind of begrudging. His grandfather was very supportive. And by the way, his grandfather, the actor in where the Fred Fern grows, actually had ties back to this area. His father was from a small town from around. Uh, so that was kind of, that's our that's our our claim to fame where, where where the red fern grows is the actor who played grandpa actually had local ties. But yeah, without a doubt, you want to you know create a setting that people understand even if they haven't been in it, and that's and so that takes a, a little bit of trick. You gotta it's it's a lot of work there to write a book. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine how much work it really is. I mean. It's, it seems mind boggling to me that, you know, I, I can't write two sentences without messing up. You know, I can't. Oh, I know about that. <laughs> yeah. You're a, I'm going to tell you, just talking to you, you're obviously an extremely, extremely intelligent man and the type of people that uh, we need in the coon hunting world to be able to portray us as not just dumb rednecks out here drinking moonshine and treating right. coon. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Oh, no, uh, no, you're exactly right because you, you get this perception. Uh, uh, those folks, like, well, we talked about that. You know, if, if somebody's writing legislation because they don't understand what it means to run with a hound or that uh, they've got a perception of us, well, you got to kind of dispel that uh, and show them, yeah. Now, I say we're we a pretty gritty bunch. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you get out there, you, we go through thorns. I mean, I've, <laughs> I tell I tell my, my parents I'm getting numb because I'll look down and I'm, I'm all cut up, and I didn't don't even remember it. I said, I'm bleeding here. Oh, I'll tell you another story here, a uh, Kunat story with a, a dog named Ty, which is one of the characters in the first book. He had treed a raccoon in multi-floor rows, and I shot the raccoon out. But I had to crawl in that underneath that multi-floor rows, and I got to a point where I couldn't move. I had multi-floor rows. Literally, I couldn't lift my head. I'm on my chest. And I'm literally crawling. I just couldn't get to it. And I, you know, he did. He, you know, rack dog can get through the, you know, figure out how to get through the thorns. So I couldn't. I'm just literally trapped. I can't move an inch one way or another without getting stuck. And I just looked at Ty and said, Ty, bring that raccoon to me. And you know what? He did. Can you believe that? He's like, he was a retriever. 
I said, I couldn't believe it. He said, oh, he brought that raccoon and he picked it up in his mouth and brought it to me. I said, you gotta be kidding me. But, uh, yeah, but again, it is painted post, right? <laughs> we always go back to that. But, uh, but yeah, as far as if you were claustrophobic, uh, you wouldn't want to be where I was. You were literally, I just, you couldn't move. I was just encased in thorns, uh, but I just couldn't get further. I just couldn't move ahead any further. But that's a, that's a little bit of our mentality. You know, we, we, we're not going to abandon the dog. We're going to get out there and we're going to do what we can, except for that mistake I was told you about a while ago. Says. But the idea is that that's, that's the bond. You honor the commitment between both of you, you and the hound, you go to that hound and, and the like. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And let's be honest, most people nowadays, their only experience with coon hunting is where the red fern grows, right? Yeah. So how important is it to you that your book shines such a positive reflection on the sport of coon hunting to so many people of all different walks of life and beliefs? That's an outstanding question, and it's extremely important to portray that. Uh, and that's where I think we were coming from, is that you, uh, you want to say, you want to dispel any biases or prejudices people might have and actually show that, uh, hey, these folks are pretty caring and concerning folks. They'd die for their dog. They'd ri- well, I'll say they'd risk life and limb. I mean, they may not tend to die, but, but you know, hey, we've had people go over a cliff to get a dog, you know, uh, up here. Uh, literally one guy, the dog went over a cliff, was on the edge, and uh, he went back home, got a rope, lassoed the dog, and brought the dog up. <laughs> but I, and I'm sure if somehow he could have done that, he would have scaled down that cliff to get that dog. So it's just, that's what you're trying to show is, listen, this is not a one-way ticket. Uh, this is not just like the, what I was telling you about the one person, the dog does all the work. That's absolutely not true. And so you've got to show that that determination and grit. What you find, too, is uh, you find a lot of people won't go out in the woods at night. And so that right off the bat, and to us, we we're like, well, of course we go out. That's how we were raised. But uh, but you talk to a lot of folks, uh, they you go out in the woods at night. Yeah. Uh, so they're that right off the bat, you kind of hook their curiosity, if you will, because that's something that we take for granted that a lot of folks uh, just they're not used to anymore. Uh, you know, it can, because what their only experience with coon hunting is where the red fern grows. And so, uh, which is a good experience. We're not taking anything away from that for sure, but you got to go ahead and continue to build that, uh, continue to show the folks who we really are, uh, are not uh, some bloodthirsty person out there shooting up the woods by any shape or form and you know and i'm not sitting here i'm not going to die on where the red fern grows the book because it is an amazing book mm-hmm. and it has introduced a ton of people to coon hunting right but or oh, yeah. coon hunting has changed so much since then you know we're not out here cutting down trees yeah 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 billy when he was first out there you remember he was out there with an axe right yeah uh, now and i read some old books oh these books I mean, they were written in the 50s, and they were talking about, you know, even earlier than that, where they blamed the coon hunter for uh, getting rid of den trees. Now, mm-hmm. I, you know, and, uh, and I got to thinking, that's not true. Of course, again, it was an old book. It was an old book. But then I got to thinking, I said, well, you know, maybe way, way back when, you know, close to a century ago now, that maybe if somebody didn't have a gun, maybe they were cutting down the den trees. But to even imagine that today, as you said, it's changed so much that, you know, we, we sit there, we're trying to preserve it. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> uh, my father was, as a forest ranger, was one of the advocates to get den trees identified as second use trees so that they would leave the den trees. And uh, I, I'm just trying to explore whether they still have that designation here in upstate New York. But the idea, though, is, yeah, if it's a den tree, it's no good for timber. Uh, maybe firewood, but, you know, cut down another tree. If you got a den tree that took literally decades to create, you want to keep that tree up uh, so that can, you know, can house the raccoon. In some cases, house that fisher. In some cases, house that porcupine, whatever. <laughs> Hopefully, there's a raccoon in that den tree. And uh, you want that for the animal so that they, that this generation can go ahead and transition to the next. So, yeah, that's, uh, again, that aspect of who we are. We are just as much about the environment and the hounds and the, and the game as anything else. 
in your book, Nathan actually thanks his logger friend for not cutting down the den yeah, trees. He does. That's right. He, uh, right in the beginning of an exceptional hound, that's in the first mm-hmm. chapter. Yeah. He says uh, he knows the logger and the logger says, yeah, I'm leaving the, and that was intentionally put in there as you can imagine by me to, that, uh, to go ahead and highlight that to say, Hey, keep those den trees up. Um, but that's not, like I said, the, uh, when Billy was hunting back in the depression, uh, you know, things were different then, uh, and they're much different now. We, we're not out there with axes cutting down trees, that's for sure. No, I mean, we're walking around with $2,000 thermals, you know. Yeah, right, I mean, right, right. I mean, <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, that was one of the jokes that if you uh, if you want your, your kid never to get on drugs, have them raise a coon on because they'll never have money for drugs. <laughs> You're exactly right. I completely agree with you there. I mean, God. oh yeah, oh, the GPS unit alone. You're here. Yeah. GPS on a unit of collar. You're probably looking. You're looking at a, over a thousand dollars anymore. Yep. So unless you, you got to use one. Yeah. Then you got to buy more collars because you got more dogs. Yeah, that's so. right. Yeah. That's it's a it's a never ending cycle, isn't it? Yeah. No. So yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know if people really realize how technologically advanced it is. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, we 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 definitely have come a long way. When I when I again when I think about it, now it was interesting you mentioned that because book five is a prequel to the book, so it takes place in 1962. Mm-hmm. So all all that technology is gone again. <laughs> yeah. So you're back into uh, you know, now these believe it or not, they still had headlamps back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, they were basically much different than they are today, and uh, you know, had the uh, basically the acid based. Uh, Big, great, big, heavy batteries that you wore on your belt. Uh, so they were different than uh, what we what we see today. Today, I've got a the 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 battery is built right into the headlamp, and it's it's literally just ounces. So you don't even yeah. feel it when it's on your head. It lasts all night, and, yeah. uh, and you could switch between the different the different colors and the spotlights. And I'm like, I, and I think about that often when I'm out there laughing. I said I used to go through this wood with a two cell flashlight, you know, and uh, it just a little dim light and. You, you can still see the raccoon, but I mean, today, you know, I'm out there, I've got a floodlight when I'm walking, you know, cause I, I switch on there. So yeah, the technology, uh, today is most certainly made it. But uh, when I was writing, uh, the prequel, the forest ghost, uh, I had to reach back to a, a more, more, a kid, when I, I was in the mid seventies, not the early sixties. That's before I was born, but, but, uh, but I had to reach back more to when I was a kid growing up is to explain now what's going on, you know, about the, the, the collars, or, or, or should say, the lack of collars, and the technology that we have today. Yeah, and I think it's awesome that you know. I don't know if William Rawls was even a coon hunter. I'm not sure. Um, I want to say he was. He, oh, was, he was. Yeah, I want to okay. say I saw a. Uh, I, I want to say it was wide open spaces. In fact, I, I think I even saved the link somewhere. I'll send it to you. But but he was, and he was another one. Like uh, I want to say James Harriet who wrote the book, couldn't get anybody to uh, buy it initially. Uh, I think he actually threw out the original copy of Where the Red Fern Grows, and then he found somebody was interested in it, and he rewrote it. He rewrote the thing from scratch. And, uh, by the way, it wasn't originally called Where the Red Fern Grows. It was the editor that changed the title. I can't remember what his title was, but it wasn't Where the Red Fern Grows, according to that article. I'll see if I can't find that for you and send that link because I actually wrote to the person that um, wrote it. And uh, I said that you just shed all kinds of light on how Where the Red Fern Grows became a book in Wilson Rolls. But I'm pretty sure he was, in fact, a coon hunter. I'll double check that for you. I'll send you that link and then you can share that in your next episode. Yeah. When you send me that, you know, if you can find it, we'll put it on the Facebook page, too. OK. There you that go. way, you know, along with this episode when it's posted. So that people can uh, look back and read. That's pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. So what would you like to tell anyone that is considering reading your saga? Well, well, one thing uh, from a lesson learned from another reader is it's a saga. It's a continuing saga. So you got to kind of read them in order. Uh, I had one young lady who uh, was actually part of the inspiration for the prequel. Uh, but she told me that she ordered the books, books one and two. Book three wasn't out yet. Uh, but, uh, now there's, now there's pretty quick. There's going to be five books, but, uh, book one and two, she ordered them. Well, book two came first for whatever reason. And she couldn't wait. So she read book two first and then she went back and read book one. She says, she says, all oh, that kind of ruined it for her because again, it's a, it is a sequence saga. So that's a, the idea of a saga is you start, you know, you, you know, if you're 
like a Game of Thrones fan or something like that, you imagine, or any series that you like, think of a television series you like, imagine jumping in at series three and then going back to, you know, the, the, the season three and then going back to season one. It kind of ruins things for you because you, oh, wait, but I know what's going to happen. So uh, I would tell them if you're gonna if you're gonna read it, yeah, read it in order. That's a, a pretty basic thing. Uh, now that there's a prequel, I guess you could start with the prequel once that's out there. It should be out there within the next couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, if, if I would tell them, yeah, this is uh, especially uh, it's it's basically a fa family saga. Uh, it is about family. It is about the relationships uh, between brothers brother fathers and sons even mothers and their and their children so it it, it does build on that it it's uh, one person described as is uh, the waltons go chasing raccoon okay well that's fine <laughs> describe it how you want to right but uh but that's pretty accurate too it is it is just it is a family saga it is about uh as much it is well, let's go back to that earlier quote it is just as much about the people as it is about the actual going out there and hunting and I can tell you, there's there's some tear jerking moments in there too. Now, so well, well, it's, I, I I've told a couple of people that if uh, if you you can't make somebody's eyes moist when you're writing about coonhounds, then uh, well, you did something wrong, right? So, <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that that's really back into what you see with that bond. If I have done that, if I have created that kind of emotion, because the purpose of fiction is what to evoke emotion. I'm actually quoting a guy that I didn't know I was quoting him, but it's a a famous editor named Stein. But he'd actually said that too, but I was saying it, didn't know he said it. But the idea is behind fiction is you're supposed to evoke emotion. And so, uh, and uh, you saw that where the red fern grows too, as a matter of fact. And the, and the whole spectrum of emotions, right? You're, you know, the, from the joys to the defeats to the, you know, the happy times and even the sad times. So that's, that's what you try to do as an author is to totally involve the reader in that world. When they get to the book, they're mad at you because the book ended. And that's, and I've had <laughs> a couple of people say, <laughs> my wife has uh, listened to readers call and I tell them they're on speakerphone, but they call up here and they, and they, uh, they'll go on about the different characters and everything else. So I said, okay, well, and that's just great. I like talking to my readers. They're a lot of fun that way. The other thing I will tell you this too, and this is, this is what amazed me as a writer. When you're a writer, particularly a first time writer, you think that everybody's going to have the same perception and take away the same thing that you do. And it's absolutely false. Uh, every individual takes away their own take on the book. It's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. For example, I asked a, a young lady that I knew. She was, she was a coon hunter and my age. She had finished book one. And I said, well, what was the most important part of you? And I was ready to hear something about the hunts or something like that. And she said to me, throwing the stones. And I know her. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at going, what? <laughs> you know, now I say I know her. We had separated as kids, and this now decades later, we're back as adults, right? So that shocked me that she said that. I said, well, okay, that's cool. That's important, you know, the, the rock throwing. But why was it important to you? She says that's, you know, she was a single mother. She goes, that's what me and my son used to do. I said, oh. Okay. I tell you when I, again, when I was asking people about the first book, I went through two dozen people, two dozen readers before I got two people who liked the same scene. And then I went through another three dozen before I got somebody who that I thought, I said, what's your favorite scene? I finally got somebody who liked the, the favorite scene that I did. So it's like, okay. So again, that just kind of ingrained in me that individuals are going to put themselves into that book. Uh, and take away from the story a very, very personal, private uh, meaning of that story. And uh, God bless them for that. I said, go for it. That is uh, that is your book. And I will tell you one other thing was I was at one point considering another book, basically a tell-all, right, uh, explaining, you know, some of the, the real stories behind the stories. And I was explaining this to uh, a young lady who's one of my reader fans. and She was actually uh, our class president in high school. And as soon as I finished, we were eating lunch. And as soon as I finished, she looked at me and said, don't. I said, what? She says, don't. She says, you're going to replace your memories with what they took away. And as soon as she said it, she was right. And um, uh, so I said, you know what? You're right. So, uh, yeah, there's not going to be a, a book explaining, oh, well, there, there was this hound that matches up with this hound or something like that. You're not going to see that because I don't want to replace what you as the reader took away versus what I as the writer wrote. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's as much uh, your story as it is mine. Uh, and, and you reading it, me writing it. So, yeah, yeah you learn a lot as a, as a writer. 
And I'll just go on ahead and say my favorite scene of the book was, or so far, has been when they were hunting old Scarface. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think that was my favorite. And then, so I read. I just want to kind of say this. So, of course, when I was researching, I went through and I read a bunch of stuff about you, a bunch of reviews. Mm -hmm. And this one lady that gave you a bad review, mm -hmm. and she wrote exactly what your book was about and said that this this is all this guy writes about is, and it was exactly what your book was about. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, that's what the book's about. That's why people like this book. You know what I mean? And oh. that kind of hit me, And but she was saying it in a negative way. And I was like, how can you? I mean, that's what he intended the book to be, you know, right, right. and I, I don't I just want to kind of say that to you. And I, I don't. Oh, yeah. One thing you learn about as a as a review and uh, yeah, it, you just got to take the, the hits. Now, I <laughs> I reacted to one uh, recently uh, bad review, but but I would and I even in my reaction, I was just writing to people on my newsletter. But I told them, I said, uh, never do this in public. I'm just I'm just like talking to friends here on the newsletter, right? Uh, but the the bottom line is is that you got to respect that folks are going to not see same things the way you do, and that's okay. You live your life, I'll live mine, kind of mm -hmm. way of, way of thinking. Uh, and so, yeah, the uh, yeah you you'll get the the good or the bad. Most of them are good reviews, but yeah, you're, you're gonna get you're gonna get those who are just who don't see it your way. Uh, I mean, actually, if you go look at uh, where the red fern grows, you'll see a bunch of one-star reviews. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of those ones, now some of those one-star reviews is because the book was printed wrong. I'm like, okay, that's not Wilson Rawls' fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's he's been dead for quite some time. And some reason you got a, a book printer that messed up the printing. That's the, but, so you give it a one star for that. But that's me, that's me, the writer talking, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the same time, but then you get the others who, yeah, they read the book and, they're just so they've got such a world view that they can't even step into the other world. Well, that's fine. That's on them. And you just got to live with it. I mean, it's just uh, where it's coming from and uh, you got to let it go. And I, I would, I would tell that same thing to anyone out there running hounds that, you know, you're going to run into people who, who just don't understand you. Uh, hopefully in my case of the books helps them to understand us, but, some people don't want to understand you. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, you go your way, I'll go mine. And uh, yeah. have, have, have a happy life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, and that's that's kind of what I got out of her review. You know, there's not many bad reviews for the people that are listening to this that haven't ever. There are not many bad reviews at all. But hers stood out to me because it was like that she's the type of person that there's no what nothing that you could write, you as a person, mm -hmm. that would please her. You know, well, you, so why yeah. even give that a bad review? You know, I mean, right. it, it, oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, way, uh, some folks told me is troll. Okay. So you got a troll and they're literally just out there. Uh, and usually think about Facebook or Instagram like that, but that's that, that same applies to if you're on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, that's a troll can show up anywhere. And you're exactly right. They're just going to be negative to be negative. And that's, you feel kind of sorry for them in one respect. Is if, if that's how you're, you're going about your life. Then, Wow, I mean, you got you're looking at everything through this prism that uh, makes everything dark, you know, and it, it's uh, it's just not the way life has to be. I mean, you can look at it. I, mean, I you and I can both look at the same sunset, and I, I expect you and I are going to say that's a beautiful sunset, and somebody else is going, well, the day's almost over, you know, complain about that. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it, but uh, we just have a different world view on that, and that, uh, and. But that's, you know, you got to respect people's opinions. That's that's who they're going to be. Uh, and uh, you'd like to you know, try to shed some happiness in their life if you could. But uh, at the same time, you know, that's uh, sometimes people are their own worst enemies, if you will. And uh, that's, what, that's what you get. So what I would, you know, what I would tell, especially a young writer, uh, you know, I'm you know, kind of got some miles on me now, but, uh, you know, a young writer, like you said, that one star review would destroy them. I mean, it would just take their ego and just crush them. And they, who knows? They might be, have a brilliant second book in them. The first book might have been brilliant. And, uh, and that kind of just, just destroyed them. And that's where you got to kind of build those folks up and say, Hey, uh, let that go. You, you can't please everybody. You, you know, you'd like to, but you can't. So just move on. And that, that, yeah, that's for writers, but that's really about anybody and, and any, walk of life you're just not going to please everybody 
Yeah, and I completely agree. And it's to me, it's one thing if you have conviction about why you don't like that book. Like if you have a true meaning, or or this podcast, for instance, somebody has conviction about why you don't like that, then that is perfectly fine. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. But yeah, if yeah. it's just because you got a different view than me, I mean. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, if you if you didn't like the style of writing or something like that, okay, mm-hmm. well, that's fine. Yeah. You, yeah, okay, I'm not your I'm not your author, but uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's just you could tell by the ways some people react, not just a book but anything. It's, mm-hmm. it's, they're just not going to be happy. They just yeah. they're they're happy not, if you will, they're happy not being happy. <laughs> yes, I agree. So, so yeah, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, so just you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, say a prayer for them. And, uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, someday they'll have that light switch come on in their own personal life, and they'll say, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so negative. Maybe I can I can see things in a different light. Well, that's what you hope for anyway, right? So. Yeah. So, and we're going to shift gears here a little bit. So mm-hmm. now you're not only a coon hunter and author. You're mm-hmm. also a retired survival expert from the United States Air Force. And well, to me, that is fascinating, right? So. Okay. Can you tell me some more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's my my first as I I was uh, first enlisted for the for approximately the first ten years, and then I was an officer. I became an officer in the last ten years, and so a little over ten years. And uh, in my enlisted days, I was air crew life support, so we would go ahead and we you know taught the pilots uh, the base level training. Now, I was air crew life support, so there is a true survival instructor. They were usually embedded at our unit. Uh, not always. So, you know, when we were doing the training, if they were there, they let it. We supported them. If they weren't there, then obviously we had to leave the training. And do the so, yeah, we had to you know go to basic survival training and all the others. I I got the basic survival training. Uh, I did not get to water survival training or desert survival, although we did you know, scenarios like that. I didn't get to the formal training. But, yeah, I was uh, that was part of my job at one time is to yeah teach people. You know, how to live in the woods, you know, how to get through the woods, how to use a knife, how to you literally how to put on camouflage. Yeah. So you <laughs> just different things. So you uh yeah, you do that was a very special part of my life. And and you know the thing is, you know, having been raised in the woods, uh, uh that was something that just came natural. I mean, I was that, that was to me, yeah, I'm actually taking my life experiences and I'm actually getting paid for it now. <laughs> So it was kind of, it was kind of fun. It was fun. You know, and I'll, let me tell you something. When you did a training scenario, you would start at six o'clock uh, Friday morning and you would finish at 10 o'clock Saturday morning and you did not sleep in between. Those were some long days. Those were some long days. But at that time when I was doing it, it was down in Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia. And you did it uh, uh, every other weekend and you look forward to it. I mean, it was just, okay, let's get out there and let's, let's go ahead and, and do our training and, and make our, our air crews the best they can be in terms of survival. Yeah. So it was a, it was a pretty cool job without a doubt. Yeah. With me working offshore in the Gulf, you know, I take water survival. Oh yeah. And it is not a pleasant class. I can go on ahead and tell the people that are listening to this right now. I'm sure it's different from what, well, I guess like as far as on the the raft side and what you do when you're in the raft, it would probably be about the same as what the Air Force. I would, I would, Im- yeah, I would imagine. I mean, especially in a water survival situation, you're mm-hmm. lim- you're pretty limited, extremely on, uh, on what you can and cannot do. We as coon hunters, we walk around the woods at night all alone, all the time. Can you walk me through what you feel like as a survival expert we should have with us while right. we hunt? Yeah. Okay. And that's again an excellent question. Um, you know, and that's a, it's a tough one to answer uh, because depending on where you're at, right? So, uh, yeah, should you have first aid training? Absolutely. That's going to get you your training and your background is what's going to get you through. You'll learn to improvise too. If let's say if I didn't have a tourniquet, well, by the way, a tourniquet is one of the last things you ever want to put on. But uh, but you know, let's say you want to put on a bandage net, you'll you'll improvise. I always always carry. A handkerchief with me, a large handkerchief with me. And now, and the idea though is, you know, if I ever really got hurt, that that would act as a bandage where I can, you know, you know flow or stem the flow if I was bleeding really bad, which could happen. But in all the terms of equipment, again, it's back to the knowledge before you got out there. I mean, that's a, by the way, it's an outstanding question. 
questions. And, I mean, and that you really made me rack my brain. I was like, well, how do how do I, how do you think how do you answer that one? And really, it comes down to your attitude. And the attitude is that it's informed by your education out there. You'll get through it. You know, that's that's the thing. For example, I broke my ankle on the very first night of coon season, uh, 2018. I broke my ankle out there, and I was over 900 yards in the truck. Uh, my dad was in the truck, but he, you know, he, he can't walk at that time. He just had to sit in the truck and watch us on the GPS. And he would later tell me, he says, I noticed you were walking back kind of slow. <laughs> Cause I didn't want to tell him that dad had broke my ankle. In fact, I would not admit my ankle was broken until four months later after the season. But the idea though, was I knew that, uh, I, I did stabilize it. You know, I kind of stuffed, I had, that's what was the problem was I had rubber boots on. I had leather boots on and I kind of stuffed it so I could keep my ankle one place that said it still popped out at 800 yards i figured it popped out 80 times out of joint but the idea is i didn't panic and that's really what the thing is yeah it was smart to do what i did uh in terms of packing uh, the boot around it but at the same time it was the attitude that okay i'm going to get through this i had a walking stick i would tell you carry a walking stick when you're out there that's uh that was something i learned not necessarily in the air force survival school but actually in the hiker's bible was carry walks it and that really uh, you know assisted me obviously that night uh because i could use it as a crutch and i did uh and i by the way I, and at the same time i'm controlling two coon hounds walking back we'd already took the raccoon thank goodness obviously i couldn't put them on a leash i was just controlling them with a collar but they knew i think especially seth says sense that you know, something's wrong with the something's wrong with <laughs> my master here and uh, uh he's he's hurting and uh he kind of stayed close. He's a little overprotective as a hound, I think, sometimes, <laughs> going back to the dog. But uh, but really, you know, one is the knowledge before you get in that situation. So you should know first aid. You definitely should know how to sharpen and use a knife. And in a land situation, I would tell you that one thing you should always go into, into the woods, you should be carrying a knife. But the walking stick is a very, very close second, if not first, depending on your situation. Right? So, but But again, it's the attitude that you have that, okay, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to, you know, get snake bit out there. We have timber rattlers up here. Now, by the time we're out in the woods in the hunting season, the, the timber rattlers have generally already gone in. It's gotten too cold for them. But during the training season, sure, that's warm enough where they can be out there. So what happens if you do get snake bit? Well, if you know what to do, you're not going to panic. And that's what I tell people is, you know, that, or, you know, or that's what I would tell people now is that get the training ahead of time. Don't panic. Another thing, too, and this I know I'm going to sound like a hypocrite here, is don't go out in the woods alone. I know I do it every time. <laughs> right? I'm out there 99% of the time I'm out there by myself. But with today's cell phones, uh, I have access that if I really had to, I never had, ever called for help. But if I had to, at one point, I've got to you know, realize I ain't going to make it. Uh, it. You know, I would basically get on the phone and say, hey, here's the situation. Here's where I'm at. I would tell you. Uh, yeah, I had a, a incident a couple of years ago where I fell and my GPS unit and my, uh, I had a walkie talkie fell out of my pocket and I, and you think I could find them? I fell in the moss. I was in the moss, could not find them. I had to lead those dogs on a 13 mile trek out of there and you know how did I do it? Cause I don't even, cause I, another bad thing I did that night was I was using the GPS unit as my compass. Always have a compass with you too. You got to learn how to you know, tell directions in a map. Always have a compass. So I didn't have that. So what did I do? Well, physically I was fine. It just said I had no way to orient out of there. Too thick cloud. The trees were too thick. Moon was even up yet. In fact, it was a cloudy night. I couldn't even navigate by the stars. So what you do if you're not hurt and you're an adult, you follow a stream because you you follow a stream and you keep going because there's very few streams in the United States where man hasn't built a bridge over. And that's exactly what happened. It took me. 12 miles to get to a uh, down going through that mountain to, to finally come out on the road. That, that includes me wrapping them back on the road too. I mean, that was probably about 10 miles before I actually hit a road, but the, uh, but that's the idea is, you know, I knew what I had to do. I know that I have to follow this correct. That's something my dad taught me as a forest ranger, by the way, not the, not the United States air force. So the, the bottom line there was I wasn't panicking. I, I knew what I had to do. I'm I'm in a bad situation, but uh, you know now I guess I could have sat there with the dogs in, until dawn came, <laughs> you know, but I said I'm not going to do that either. It was like eight or nine o'clock at night. I said no, I'm going to go ahead and, and work my way out of here. 
So that's what I did. So that's, uh, you know, you can get yourself in a survival situation pretty quick, but if you got the knowledge to handle that ahead of time and the attitude, the right attitude, uh, you'll be okay. Yeah. And back to having a compass, you know, I, I carry a compass, you know, I, I'm going to do good to be able to get within about 600 yards where I got to get, you know, it, <laughs> okay. and, and I think that's a lot of people, you know, cause having a compass and using it's two different things, right? Yeah, right. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. When I say, yeah, let, let, let me point that out. Cause you're exactly right. Uh, you have to have a compass and you have to be able to know how to use a compass. And one thing that dad said is I've had a lot of people, I had a buddy of mine who's just, in fact, we hunted when we were kids and he's just started again. And now we, with this night, we still had the electronic compasses. He had a different system than I did. Uh, but I said, well, we, we came in north as I knew the woods. So we came in north. We got to go out south. And he was pointing in the exact opposite direction against his compass, <laughs> against his compass. The compass was telling him the same thing I was telling him. But he said, no, that's not right. We got to go that way. I said, no, David. <laughs> that's going to take us over the, oh, that's literally going to take us over a cliff. I said, we got to go the other way. And uh, he said, no, I said, no, trust me. It, it's a, he said, he kind of begrudgingly said, okay, well, I'll follow you. And he did. And he said, you were right. I said, yeah, well, because the compass wasn't lying. You know, the yeah. compass was right. <laughs> compass can't lie. Uh, but, you know, another thing too is, you know, if you can see the big dipper, because if you have stars out and you, and you don't have a tree canopy that's blocking where you can see, Remember the last two stars of the Big Dipper in the cup, not the handle, in the cup. You follow that out, you're going to hit the North Star. You're going to hit Polaris. So that will also tell you to point you in the right direction, too. So well, that's North. And I, when I get lazy and uh, and I don't want to look at – I don't want to take the GPS out of my pocket or I don't want to take a compass out, I just look up and say, okay, that's North. You know, I can always orient. If <laughs> you, you don't have a, a leaf canopy – and you uh, and you don't have clouds that are, are blocking your view of the sky, uh, so I do get la lazy sometimes. But I'm still navigating, though. I think you'd agree. Uh, I'm still navigating, getting there. Uh, and then you can, you know, what, and practice makes perfect. So do it every single time you go out there, and you'll you'll get good at it. And I will tell you this: that even in the woods that I've known since I was a kid, you can get turned around, especially when you're looking for a raccoon around a tree. So you're circling that tree. You know, three, four, five, maybe more times uh, trying to, especially if you got a tree like on a hemlock or something like that and a pine tree and you're trying to get that raccoon to look down, you'll go around that tree and you'll get disoriented. Now, one thing we've got up here, is, you know, especially in the season is snow. So we can we can backtrack in the snow, too. That's another thing. But let's say, you, you know, you're in the January thaw, the snow is melted and uh, you've gone around that tree several times. Well, you're disoriented. And I break out the compass. I have. No, I don't have to have some kind of pride saying, oh, I know how to get out of here. I'll, I'll break out that compass and find out that I'm not going in the right direction or I, or I was going to head in the wrong direction. And, uh, and that's where you say, okay, all right, uh, follow the compass, trust the compass. <laughs> that's probably some of the best advice I've given on this whole little rant here. Yeah, and that is really, really good advice. And us as canards now, with being as technologically advanced as we are, I think we forget about the small stuff, you know? Yep, yep, you're exactly right. I hunt a lot by myself, and I hunt out of a boat a lot by myself, especially during the winter. So one thing that I do in particular, which not everybody has access to this, I do because of my job. I wear a life jacket mm -hmm. with an EPIRB. I know that a lot of people can't do that, but I do that when I'm by myself and I'm in a boat. If yeah. my life jacket inflates, that EPIRB is going to go off. Okay. And my that, wife knows that to tell the people that to look for that EPIRB. Okay, so that's, is that a beacon like? No, it's an actual uh, personal locator. Okay, yeah, okay, that's all right, I, I call in, that a beacon. Yeah, yeah, beacon, a built into the, uh, you know, the personal, yeah, and it transmits the uh, signal on okay. search and rescue. Okay. Yeah, and that's what I wear when I go out of a boat by myself, and, and that's something that I do that, you know, that's kind of overboard probably, but if something uh, was to happen, I would want my family at least to be able to find me. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, no, my I body. think that's I think yeah. that's a smart thing to do. Is that you've uh, got a way. I mean, if you are become disabled, yeah. you, like say you break a leg. I know you're in a, you're a boat, but let's say that uh, you're in a situation where you break a leg and you really can't move. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you'd want something to go ahead and do that. I was joking around because I did get back in. This is this is snow and ice. And I oh, I got way back in, and uh, and I and I was laughing. I said, if I break a leg now, they won't find me till the spring. Uh, and what's left of me, I should say, in the spring. 
And so my goal was, was to go ahead and hug the dog so they had a GPS unit. They could find me. So they could find me right with the dog in the spring. That's <laughs> they'll find it. They'll know exactly where I was. I'll still be dead, but they'll know exactly where to find the body. Uh, but yeah, you yeah. So I, you know, I'm absolutely for that. Uh, that's a. I think that's a pretty clever device. I'm. I'm sure if my wife listens to this, and my mom and dad listen to this. They're saying you're getting one because <laughs> when you get out there. But yeah, that tells you where you're at. So yeah. I say, God bless you. Yeah, people. I mean, and. I'm sure a lot of people probably don't even know what an EPIRB is. I mean, you do because you were, you were in the Air Force, right? So yep. I, mean, I know I knew that you would know what a beacon was. Well, at, I, I, I hadn't heard it called that. Yeah, we we have, when we have a beacon, when I say beacon, it was a light beacon, but a radio transmission. Yeah, and, and I had not heard that that term before that EPIRB. But when you, I said that's got to be a beacon the way you're yeah. on. Yeah, it's so. emergency position indicating radio beacon. Okay. Yeah, EPIRB. So oh. yeah, it's a beacon. Yeah, like you said. So talk about how your Air Force background ties into your books. Okay, that's no, that's interesting. I would say that again, maybe being good at survival and being a coon hunter, one being good at one makes you better at the other. So yeah, it's hard to say what was it the experience I had in the woods growing up. Does that play more into the books versus the Air Force? I'd probably say that was more, but there might be a couple. Well, actually, in book five in terms of uh, survival tricks there might be a couple there that you could say well that was that that harkens back to his air force experience maybe i could say that but uh, mostly uh the books come from the actual hunting experience mostly uh the character in, in the book five the forest ghost is a character that was introduced in an exceptional hound which is Uncle Arthur, he's not uncle then, he's because he's a teenager then. And the idea was, well, he's a lot of people have described him, as we were talking about earlier, as, as a modern mountain man. Well, how did he get those skills? And so, you know, so I do go into uh, how he learned those, everything from sharpening a knife to, to fleshing a hide, all these things that he has to learn because he's absolutely, uh, he's eager, as I explained in the back of the book cover, he's eager, but he's just, He's not a natural, as you might think. I, I shouldn't say that. He's actually a very quick study, but at the same time, he's he doesn't like pick it up the first time. He's got to try, try, try again before he actually gets something. So a lot of those, that was always in the back of my mind is, how does he become who he is? Everything, he, he uses a bullwhip. How did he learn how to use a bullwhip? And um, so they're just different things that 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 were all the hints of his background in the other four books that now I have to bring back into this book and explain, well, how did he get there? You know, how does that, so I, hopefully I did a good job. Uh, it took a while. This is the longest of the books. I mean, it's a, it's <laughs> actually, I got the, I got a proof copy right here. I got double, let me double check, see what the page count here, 373 pages. So uh, that's, this is, that's probably, that is the longest book, but as part of, because you, you know, you had to explain, I felt the need to explain how does Arthur become Arthur? How does he know what he knows? Because he's hinted throughout the series that he's got this background, that he has this insight into certain things. And so I, I said, well, let's explain how he knows that or how he how he senses that. Uh, you know, where did he pick up this skill? And so we, and, uh, and who taught him that skill? So he has several different mentors throughout the entire book. So that's where you know we had to. Or I think we, I had to go ahead and uh, take all that stuff and bring it to uh, into a, a story, and uh, the backstory now becomes the story in in the Forest Ghost. So that was a lot of uh, a lot of fun, a lot of research, a lot of research went into that one. So uh, I, I definitely enjoyed writing it. And earlier you were talking about Seth is on the cover of a few of your books, him being a black hound. I noticed on this new book. You had a red bone on there. That's well said because in the forest ghosts, yeah, I, I had all the, I had all the breeds or most, a lot of the breeds. We had blue ticks, black and tans, walkers, cur. And uh, so I said, well, it's time for red bone. I know that's where Wilson Rawl started, but that's where I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of worked my way up the red bones. So uh, the main hound in the forest ghost is a red bone. She's, and she, her name is Renee. It's short for renegade. So, uh, but, uh, they, you only hear her full name once. She's Renee throughout the entire book. So, uh, but he, uh, he has, he becomes bonded with this hound, as we were talking about before, that, that bond. You always got to create that bond between the hunter and the, and the characters in, in the book. 
And uh, so, yep, front cover of book five, there is a red bone hound that is a local hound. I don't own her. Uh, she is one of the prettiest hounds I've ever seen. She's just absolutely gorgeous. She's a bench champion. I saw her on Facebook, and I saw that she was local, and I contacted the owner, and we sat down for a photo session, and I got all kinds of pictures of her that I basically ended up uh, putting her on the cover with. And that was great. The other thing is uh, on that, about that front cover, is that is where the Tioga River meets the Khan Hocken to form the Shemong. That is the traditional place of Painted Post birthplace. Even before the American Revolution, this was the place of the Painted Post. And that's where it was always known to be, it was where those rivers. So that was kind of a, you know, having driven by it for, you know, almost a half a century uh, in, in Painted Post and not actually gone there, but I actually went there. I followed the river up there and, and took those photos. So I said, that's got to go on the front cover. So that is authentic. That is not a Photoshop river. That is a, the real place where the rivers meet to form painted post. Yeah, and it is a beautiful photo. You know, and I, I encourage everyone to go to your website. Yeah, Ryling Creek 2. Yeah, Ryling Creek 2.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and two, 2 being spelled out, too. It's not the number. <laughs> yeah, and we'll put the link to your website in the description box below. Oh, excellent. Uh, and also to sign up for your newsletter because that thing is so interesting, man. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Reading Thank all the short stories and everything. It's it's awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Glad you like that. Yeah, it really is. And I, I, I encourage everyone to go do that. And I think a lot of people are going to really hear about your book that haven't heard about it yet because, I mean, it kind of shocked me that I was one of the only cane hunters that knew about it to begin yeah. with. It's it's they're relatively. I mean, they've only been out for a couple of years, and uh, so and as a self-published author, your marketing is kind of limited, right? You, as far as your resources. So, uh, like this, this podcast here is obviously helping me get the word out that these books exist. I'm no longer on Facebook. I used to be on Facebook, but I got off last year. To be honest with you, that was the smartest thing I did. Be I was putting so much time into maintaining the Facebook page and coming up with interesting posts two to three times a week that uh, it was taken away from writing the books. The uh, authors warn each other, don't get hung up in social media so much. They forget you're supposed to be writing your next book. And unfortunately, that was exactly what was happening to me. And uh, I would tell you that because of Facebook, that the, the Forest Ghost is probably six months late as a result. And I got off last November. So I, uh, it was just a matter of I got to get back in. There were, I was doing other things. I was helping other authors, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, there was just, it was such a time sink that I decided, uh, well, I had a little dust off with Facebook too. That's true. But, uh, I said, you know what? Enough's enough. And, uh, I think I'll just go ahead and uh, hang up my social media hat in that venue, create my own website. And then from there, spend more time writing, uh, than being on social media. So, so that's, yeah, if you want to get hold of me, you, know, you can get hold of me through the, the website or, or, you can sign up for the newsletter. It's free. And uh, just you know, send it on out. And I encourage everyone to support Mr. Joseph. I mean, and and to spread the word of his book throughout the coon hunting community and beyond. You know, I mean, it's a book for everyone. You know, uh, maybe not for a, yeah, I don't know, maybe not for a kid. Might be a little bit above that uh, as far as reading wise. Right. Would you say that? It was more of a. A well, red book, yeah, not, would, not in content, but in well, words. Yeah, there's. I mean, I would say, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's an adult read, and the reason I say that there is some violence in there, right? So there's yeah. some violence, and uh, so there is, yeah. Yeah, I always, you know, I'll have parents come up to me and ask me about that. I said, listen, it's an adult book. Some of them laugh at me. They said, you know, the, the TV shows that they're some of their kids are watching are a hundred times more violent. But I tell them, I said, you're the parent. Uh, read the book, and then you make the decision whether they read it. But I, my books are advertised and looking at adults. So I agree with you absolutely. This is really a, an adult book with a decision if uh, a parent says, I think uh, maybe a teenager, 16, 17-year-old can handle it. Then I'm sure they can, but most can. But again, that's the parent's decision. Uh, let me go back to that. It's the parent's decision on uh, what their children read. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It's generally geared towards yeah. adults. And I would say another thing, though, is you talk about the violence, but there's also a ton of old-fashioned family values in there. A lot more of that than there is violence, okay? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, no, you're right. I mean, is, I don't want to, I don't want everybody to think that every yeah. chapter is. Well, they ain't everybody killing everybody. <laughs> right, you exactly. know? I mean, that's, no, that's not what's happening. But, uh, uh, but you know, there is, you know, there is that. But you know, you're right. It's, it really is about uh, the family. I get that a lot where people say, I like this because of that, because we see these, uh, these values. Uh, so, and, and a lot of my readers are older because they, and they, they read them. But I also have the younger readers in their 20s and 30s who, who relate to it. And that's and I'm happy for that. I think that's a good thing that they relate to it. But it's but they like that. God bless. I did have um, a compliment from one of my beta readers on book five. And this is one of the greatest compliments you could ever get. He says, "I hope my granddaughter grows up to be Mike Mist, who is the probably the lead female of the Forest Ghost." And and you know when when somebody tells you something like that, you're going, "Whoa, your throat gets kind of tight." But but you definitely appreciate such a comment. And if it is the values. It is about that. And because that's the, the rural lifestyle, as you know, mm-hmm. that's another thing too. Is uh, you know, you were talking about the, the coon hunting, the, the bonds with the dogs, being with the woods, but it's really a rural lifestyle. It's uh, you know, it's, it's away from the hectic pace of today's. You know, it can get pretty pretty crazy out there. I think we'd all agree. And maybe stepping back and escaping for a while in a in a book about a simpler time is is the way to go. Yeah, and no, I completely agree. And I re- like I said, I recommend it to everybody. And I encourage anyone who listens to this podcast to go buy a copy. You can buy it on Amazon or directly from you, right? Yeah. 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 You can buy it directly from me. Uh, yeah. Either way is, is no matter how you get it, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, as long as you enjoyed it, you know, you, know, you get it from a library, check it out, get it from a friend. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, you know, just as long as you enjoy the story, if you're happy, I'm happy kind of thing. So, so man, I thank you so much for coming on here. I really do. And, it's been fascinating talking to you. It really has. And I, I think everyone's going to hear, I, I, they're going to, they're going to feel my fascination with it, you know, well, from, amen. and yeah, from an upstate New York perspective to seeing how we can unify, you know, yeah. right. Oh yeah. Yeah. And well, well said. I do. Like I said, I appreciate you coming on here. Well, Tyler, I, you're the one that reached out and I, I do appreciate you reaching out. Yeah, I hope it helps your book. I know it's really popular anyway, but I hope this helps it as far as maybe the people that it hasn't reached. That well, yeah, get the word out. Yeah, that's uh, word of mouth is sometimes the best advertising. Forget the internet. <laughs> it's it's somebody uh, telling his best friend, "Hey, you need to read this book," or he handed it to him. Yeah, I get I get a lot of folks who, oh, well, be, be advised. I've had I I've had probably at least two dozen instances I know of where somebody handed the book off to somebody and they can't get it back <laughs> the person won't give it back so they have to buy another copy oh well whatever <laughs> yeah you got anything else you'd like to say or uh, no, that, like that, shout out well I, I well i'll shout out to you thank you for doing this uh you're exceptionally well organized and uh and ask excellent questions and excellent insight so tyler God bless you, and I hope your podcast be just become just shoots through the roof in popularity amongst uh, again just more than coon hunters, but most certainly coon hunters out there. Yes, sir, and I, God bless you too, and I do thank you so much for being on here, Mister Joseph. My pleasure. Yes, sir. That was a great interview for Mister Joseph. I can't thank him enough for coming on here and doing that for us. And if you like what you heard here, remember, go to Ryland Creek 2, 2 being spelled out, T-W. I feel like I've said that a million times, but hopefully nobody messes it up, right? So Ryland Creek 2, 2 being spelled out, dot com. And check him out. Purchase a book if you want to. You don't have to. I'm not sitting here begging you to purchase a book or anything like that. So it really helped him out and show your support for him. And also, if you like what you hear here, please go to Apple Podcasts. Give us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. Like us on Facebook at Coon Hunting You. And until next time, y'all have a wonderful day.